Hello there, wonderful people. We are up to precept number seven. That's uh, how you would indicate seven in Japan. See, so you learn something new every day with me. So I said I would tell you the Theravada version of the precepts, and I'm going to. Of course, you probably looked them up yourself, right? But here they are. Number one, no taking life. Number two, not taking what is not given. Number three, not committing sexual misconduct. And the note here from Encyclopedia Britannica, which I, I got this version from them, but I checked it with some others, and it's pretty uh, standard. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, interpreted as anything less than chastity for the monk, and as sexual conduct contrary to proper social norms such as adultery for the layperson. Okay. Uh, number four, engaging in false speech. Number five, using intoxicants. So those are pretty much the same as the ones I've given you, but from number six on they become different. Uh, number six, eating after midday. Number seven, participating in worldly amusements. Uh, number eight, adorning the body with ornaments and using perfume. Uh, number nine, sleeping on high and luxurious beds. I've also heard high and wide beds. And number ten, accepting gold and silver, money. So those are the first ten precepts in the Theravada version, and I'm not, you know, all that knowledgeable about Theravada, but my understanding is that they do have some thing uh, somewhat akin to the Jukai ceremony in which you take the first ten precepts rather than the 287 or whatever there are. But we are up to precept number seven. So, Nishijima Roshi's version of precept number seven is don't praise yourself or berate others. And his comment on it is modern psychology tells us that most of us have some sort of superiority or inferiority complex. I think this is basically true. And because of these personal inclinations, we are prone to praise or criticize ourselves and other people. But we are all human beings. If we recognize the true situation, it is impossible to blame others for their faults, and praising ourselves is needless, it is a waste of breath. The 5th century Brahmajala Sutra, which sort of expounds and expands on the precepts, has precept number 7 as, On praising oneself... Siggy on praising oneself and disparaging others. A disciple of the Buddha shall not praise himself and speak ill of others. Or in, Are you eating something over there? No, he keeps barfing. Uh, a disciple of Buddha shall not praise himself and speak ill of others or encourage others to do so. He must not create the causes, conditions, methods, or karma of praising himself and disparaging others. As a disciple of the Buddha, he should be willing to stand in for all sentient beings and endure humiliation and slander, accepting blame and letting sentient beings have all the glory. That's an interesting one. If instead he displays his own virtues and conceals the good points of others, thus causing them to suffer slander, he commits a major offense. Okay, that's how they put it. And here is Dogen's version. Not praising yourself while abusing others. Buddhas and ancestral teachers realize the empty sky and the great earth. When they manifest the noble body, there is neither inside nor outside in emptiness. When they manifest the dharma body, there is not even a bit of earth on the ground. What are you woofing at? What is up there? Anyway, the various American and European Zen centers who use this precept from the Evolution of the Precepts study material Soto Zen Buddhist Association provided. Uh, let's give you a few of those. Uh, Shasta Abbey's version. Uh, the seventh grave precept on being proud of yourself and devaluing others. Here's a boundless way Zen. Speaking what I perceive to be the truth without guilt or blame, I vow to take up the way of not praising myself while abusing others. Uh, John Dido Lori's version is realize self and other are one. Do not elevate the self and blame others. Uh, Great Vow Zen Monastery has I vow not to praise myself while criticizing others, but to overcome my own shortcomings. Uh, let's find a long one here. Here we go. Appleton Zen Center, always reliable for a long version. Celebrate others. I rejoice in the good fortune of others. I do not, through my thoughts, words, or actions, separate myself from others through coveting, envy, or jealousy. Diane Eshin Rizetto says, I take up the way of meeting others on equal ground. Do I exist outside the realm of judgment and comparison with others? 
Do others exist when I spin in the realm of fantasy and belief? Insecurity, anger, and shame bar the way. I vow to let frozen breath, pounding heart, and churning stomach lead me through. That's an unusual one. Uh, Mel Weitzman's version, a bit, a bit long but shorter than that, is I resolve not to praise myself and downgrade others, but to maintain modesty extolling others. And Michael Elliston, no self and others are one. Do not praise yourself at others' expense. So those are some versions used in various Zen centers in uh, the U.S. and Europe. Here is Kobenchino's commentary from Embracing Mind, Zen Talks of Kobenchino Otogawa. First, he gives the Bodhisattva uh, One Mind Precept version. Sorry, I had trouble getting that out. That I covered a few videos ago if you want to go back and look, if you haven't looked. And it goes... Self-nature is mysteriously profound. In the midst of equality, in the midst of identical dharma, identity of truth, no speaking of self and others is called the precept of no praise or blame. And his commentary is, uh, it's three paragraphs, let's read it all though because I think it's pretty good. The seventh precept speaks of comparing, I am better than them, or I am not so good as him. This comparative sense makes many problems. Once it arises, it inexhaustibly continues because it is a relative concept and has no place to rest. It always moves. It gives no satisfaction. Even one who has become the most famous man in the world is still afraid. Someone will become more famous than me. Right behind love of fame, there is shame, too. This is how the comparative sense works. To go beyond this sense or mind attitude is what this seventh precept is pointing to. Like a scale, always the mind acts to put yourself high and others low. In Buddha mind, there is no such activity. The scale is always level. There are no others. There is no self. Others are self, and self is others. So comparing weights is impossible. Every Buddha and every ancestor realizes that he is the same as the limitless sky. When every Buddha patriarch, we normally say Buddha ancestor these days, uh, realizes that he is the whole sky and great earth, and obviously he or she, but this is, I'm just reading what Coben actually said. When he appears with a great body, there is no inside or outside. If he appears as a true body, there is no soil on the earth. It means he is the earth itself. You'll realize maybe that uh, that is a kind of a paraphrase of Dogen's uh, commentary on the precept. And it continues, Dogen Zenji said there is no being proud of yourself and devaluing others because there are no such others to devalue. When you devalue others, you are scratching at your body. When you are proud of yourself, you are scratching at the air. I'm not quite sure I know exactly what Coben meant by those last two sentences, but I think they're wonderful anyway. So, so you know, just kind of let them sink in. This is an interesting precept, and it reminds me of something that comes up a lot when you're at Tassajara. Tassajara being a Zen monastery up in Northern California that I spent a lot of summers with over the past few years. Uh, they, uh, they have a lot of little catchphrases they use, and they're kind of annoying. But one of them is, that's comparing mind, you know, which is an interesting thing because it's sort of a put-down. Uh, if you say something that compares yourself with others, somebody will come along and say, that's comparing mind, <laughs> you know, in, in putting you down for using comparing mind, uh, which I find interesting, sort of implying that I wouldn't be using comparing mind. But this comparing mind is always a problem. We do it habitually in life, and it seems to be useful, for example, if I'm a writer, like I am, I, I look at uh, the books by other writers and go, oh boy, that book's better than mine. And sometimes that spurs me on to write a better book. Uh, and it's a, it's a little bit competitive, but it's, it's uh, competitive in what we normally think of as a good way. But one thing I always have to remember is I can only write the book I write. So I can't write the book somebody else writes. You know, I, I can't have the life that somebody else lives. I remember when I was younger, I used to have a real problem of, of jealousy. 
and I was a mail carrier. I did this uh, part-time mail carrying job for about three or four years and over summers and sometimes even in the winters, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I would be, if I got into a rich neighborhood, I would be like fuming with anger over these rich people. They got their money by stealing from the proletariat or whatever kind of nonsense I was, I was coming up with in my mind at the time, you know, and being like, oh, I hate them, these rich people bastards, uh, you know, going like, ah, but after a while I started to think, well, you know, somebody who's living a life in a big house and, you know, has a lot of money, I don't know that they're happy, I don't know how they got their money, I don't know how hard they worked or, or whether they got, you know, born with a silver spoon and all that, I don't know how, how much pressure there is to hold on to what they have and, and fight others for it and, you know, it, it, I was watching um, Shark Tank <laughs> because one of the people from our Zen Center who comes to our Zen Center frequently told me he was on Shark Tank in, a, in an early episode and I found the episode and I watched it the other day, I think uh, two days ago. Shark Tank is this show, in case you haven't seen it, where entrepreneurs or people who have a, a, a business idea come on and they try to get, I think there's five of them, five super rich people to invest in their business. And I was looking at the five super rich people and, and my friend who's, who was on the show too, but the five super rich people and I thought, that's kind of, that's kind of a shame. Because if you become that rich and that powerful and that famous, you will never, never be able to find the real truth of things. Because you can't. It's, it's, it's hidden from you by all of your wealth and power. You would never think to try to, to find something more real, more beyond yourself, beyond wealth and power, when you have all the wealth and power you can get. I won't say never. I shouldn't say never. Uh, it rarely happens, but this is one of the stories of, of Buddha. You know, Buddha was one of those guys. He was one of those shark tank people, in a sense, in that he was very wealthy and very powerful, and he gave it all up to find something true. And that is so rare that in Buddhist circles, it's usually thought of that, that somebody who is wealthy and powerful is kind of to be pitied, but then, then again, you're getting into the praising self and blaming others thing, and it's so difficult, it's so tricky. So all I can tell you is you'll be happier to the extent that you are able to not praise yourself and blame others, and that, to me, is what I think this precept is about. But if you want something that you can praise yourself and blame others for, you can donate to me at the address that you're seeing on your screen below. Then you can praise yourself and blame all the others who don't donate to me, so that'll be great. Uh, I really appreciate those of you who keep sending me money. If you are having financial trouble, please do not send me money. Please do not. Uh, but I really thank all of you who continue to send me money and donations because that is how I make my living. Uh, it's, it's the number one thing that keeps me going. Thank you very much. Have a good time all the time. See you later. Bye.